Hello and welcome to part six of Pulling the Perfect Key in DaVinci Resolve with me, Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects. And in this final part of the series, we're going to be putting in our finishing touches. We're going to be looking at edge details, smoothing out the final sharp edges and seeing how most effectively to use our final round of color correction. All right, so this is where we left off in part five. So we have the dust going over the top of everything. We have our night, we have our lens flare, and we have our background. And I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit now and just take a look at what we need to do in this final part. So I'm actually feeling quite happy with where we are at the moment. The only thing I think we need to change is we need to have a look at a bit more detail of what's going on with the edges here uh, with regards to color. We also might have a little bit of sharp edges that we can uh, try and sort out as well because of the way that our images have been compressed. And then I want to sort of play with the idea of tying everything together uh, using a final bit of color correction as well. So sort of completing the grade. Now, before we get into the meat and potatoes of starting to make lots of changes in the Primat filter itself, I am going to do one thing that I said I wasn't going to do in the previous exercise. And that is, I'm going to take this lens flare that we've created as a separate element, and I am going to put it on top of my background image. And the simple reason for that is that Resolve ends up just being a bit more stable when we're doing lots of small corrections, if we have a lens flare as, a, um, as an effect rather than a generator. So what I can do with this to stop us from having to generate it up again is I'm just going to come up to my open effects. I'm going to go to preset and I'm going to hit save. And this will then let me save this and I can either save it into the main presets folder or I can just save it onto a hard drive somewhere. Uh, and I will call this one green screen nave flare. Okay, so I can now turn off the visibility on track two. Now it'd be very easy just to say, okay, well, why didn't you just copy and paste the flare itself, like the flare effect from track two onto track one? And the reason for that is that we have a lens blur already going on. And the way that the order works here is that it would render out the flare on our background and then it would put a lens blur on top of it. And that just wouldn't be realistic. So I'm gonna come over into my color room Actually, before I do anything like that, I'm gonna turn my render cache back off again. So come into my color room and make sure that I'm on the right clip. So I'll open up my clips here, make sure I have my background selected, open up my nodes, and I'll add another serial node. There we go. Open up my O effects. Let's find the lens flare filter. So flare, put that over the top. Then come into my presets and I'll load up a preset, search for it with date modified, and there it is, looking nice for me. So now this is working. Let's have a look at our other clip, our green screen clip. We're going to focus now first on the edges, especially the color of the edges on the hair. And if I look all the way down, I've got three different controls that are going to help me with what I'm trying to do. I've got light wrap. I've got light wrap spill and I've got edge color correction. So I'm going to turn my light wrap on. And as soon as I've done that, it's going to say due to host limitations, the light wrap with background layer feature is not supported in Resolve. Well, we saw a similar message to this in an earlier part of the course. And the reason is that we just can't feed another layer into Resolve here. So instead of using background layer, I have a choice of using solid, a color solid. Actually, if I zoom in, especially onto the hair, we'll see what this is doing. What the light wrap does is it's gonna take the edge of my key and it's gonna feed this color into it. So if we turn it off and we turn it on, we can see what it's doing. It's sort of giving us, in this, in this case, it's giving us a nice little backlight. Is this realistic for or what we actually want it to do? Uh, probably not. So let's come in and we'll choose a different color. And we've got ways of sort of either mixing it together using a lightness value. Let's come in. 
and we can change, let's just make that quite big. We can change the width. So we can have it sort of a very soft, uh, soft light just sort of wrapping around. It's a bit too soft for us. So if we've got a dark background, we might want to set this to darken or multiply. If we've got a very light background, we might, instead of having lighten, we might want to set this to screen instead. So it's just different ways of blending those back in. Uh, and the most important thing is mixing it with the original so that we're not forced to either have it completely on or completely off. Now often this can be just the kick we need to make it fit into the background. Here I think we've got two different things working. Uh, we've got the hair that possibly needs a bit of backlighting uh, because that's where we've placed our light. But we don't want to feed too much of that into the edges, the dark edges here. It just doesn't just doesn't look right. So I might even be tempted at this point just to kind of darken this out. So put the uh, blend mode to multiply and maybe just take the lightness down on that. So we have a look with the light wrap off and with the light wrap on. So we still have that feeling of the semi-transparent background but it feels a bit more in keeping with uh, what we have actually in the background itself. Maybe I'll come in and pick a screen color and find a different color green. That actually could be quite nice. Maybe mix that back down a bit more. There we go. So that's a traditional light wrap. We also have light wrap spill. So this is, you know, similar to what the uh, the light wrap's doing. And in fact, it's got the same background layer with host limitations. Uh, so this is, this is similar uh, to what the light wrap edge is doing, except it's only affecting our spill and only affecting the spill colors. So this can be even better for, for many circumstances. And actually a lot of the time, uh, I'll actually start with the light wrap spill instead of just doing the light wrap on the edge. But this is a similar idea. I'm going to come in, I'll pick a screen color and take a look at that on and off. Let's sort of zoom in. So off and on, off and on. And we, again, we've got a chance of uh, mixing it back with the original as well. So it doesn't just sort of disappear into the background. We actually have it operating like a sort of semi-transparent way of bringing that color back in. Uh, An edge color correction, well, that's just color correction around the edge. So we can choose things like the edge width, then we can come in and affect the temperature just on the edges. And this used to be a way I used to compensate for having to fix uh, the last little bits of spill suppression in an image but since the secondary spill suppression came in, I haven't had to use it that way at all. Uh, we can use it, though, uh, to add in a little bit of, again, uh, backlighting or something, if that's what we need. So let's look at the before without any of the, uh, the wraps on. And then look at the after. It's a fairly subtle difference. But actually, I think it makes a huge difference, especially when we see it big. Cool. And the final thing when it comes to this mat is maybe trying to get rid of some of the sharp edges that we have. So we pulled a really, really nice key here, but maybe some of the edges are still not quite uh, how we like it. And this is often the case when we're working on a, uh, a green screen that's been put into a compressed codec or at a slightly lower data rate. You'll often find a little bit of uh, aliasing around the edges of things that you might want to just soften up. And we have something actually fairly near the top, which is matte refinement. I said right at the very beginning that we usually work from the top down to the bottom with Primat. I often make an exception to this case with the matte refinement because we're only working with a single instance of Primat Studio on a clip and we're not breaking the subject apart. So we do one key on the hair or one key on the head and one key on the body. I want to see how much I can get done with the spill suppressor and with the light wrap. Because the light wraps can cover a whole multitude of problems. If we still need a little bit of refinement, I'm going to turn my matte refinement on 
And then I get to do things like choke the mat. So choke it inwards, choke it outwards. I get to change the gamma. Hang on, let's see something where the gamma is going to hit, which is going to be this semi-transparent hair again. So you bring the hair up and down. Oh, and there's the spidery hair that I was talking about uh, in exercise one, I believe it was. And I can do things like growing and shrinking with the black levels. All I want to do is maybe add a tiny bit of softness to it. And I can use that with the softened mat. So if I put in, I'm going to put in a ton of softness so you can really see what it's doing. There we go. And this is set by default to soften inwards. So the mat softness is only going one way. If I turn this off, it's going to blur my mat out in both directions. That doesn't look as nice. So I'm going to add one, maybe two pixels worth of mat refinement on here. And all I'm trying to do here is take out some of that stepping, some of that aliasing that we have on the edge. I could come in with the choke as well. Uh, and the choke, choke will look all right except when again we come to the hair. So if I reset my choke, you'll see that we're just getting rid of a ton of that hair. I'm not a big fan of that. So whenever I'm looking at choke, I'm always going to come back to looking at the hair details because those are the most important. Let's have a look at the matte refinement on and off. It's not too bad. I'm going to take the choke down a little bit. Let's just zoom this back out to fit. Yeah, I think we can I think we can live with that. I turn the whole key off and on. Okay, the final thing now is just adding an overall color grade to to the whole thing to sort of tie everything together. And we've got different ways of doing this. But the way I like to do this is by using groups. So I'm going to turn on my clips here and I'm going to have both of my clips selected. And I'm going to right click on them and I'm going to go add into new group. And I'll call this one green screen group. Uh, and I like I like using groups. Groups are uh, exceptionally useful things. So we can group all backgrounds together. We can group all the green clips together and make color corrections across entire timelines. So once we have this, turn off the open effects and turn off my clips and I'm going to turn on my notes. I can now decide to actually color correct a group pre-clip which means color correct it before any of the other effects have hit it here or color correct the clip on its own or color correct the group post clip so after everything's happened or I can also color correct on the timeline. So here I'm going to color correct the group post clip I'm just going to come maybe add a little bit of extra contrast to this across the entire image, change my pivot point, maybe not quite add quite that much contrast. Take my gamma down. Let's just look at the uh, look at my scopes, make sure I'm not pushing anything too far down. And push this a little bit greener, take the saturation down. And then in my curves, I'll come over to the luma versus saturation. Hit both the little presets down the bottom and then just drag that so that my whites and my blacks stay white and black. And the reason we can use groups like this is because we balance these clips together uh, quite near the start. And the flexibility of this is that now if this is part of a, uh, a bigger edit, I can also come in and then affect the whole timeline over the top of uh, the whole thing. So let's add a serial node into here. Uh, let's add a fast film process over the top. Come into the effects browser. Let's see what we got. So I quite like that uh, cool saturation boost. Let's hit apply on that. Mix that back with the original. And let's just preview that through. And there we have our key. Now if I was being hypercritical, I'd readjust some of the edge color on the hair again and mix that back so it's a bit more suitable for the color grade that we've got. But the steps that we made to get here would always be the same. So through this brief course, we've looked at how we pull the primary key whilst also maintaining as much of the hair detail as possible. We've then looked at how we can use color rather than matte refinement to actually make those semi-transparent pixels work. 
And this is something that's really useful, not just for hair, but for things with motion blur, for clothing that's semi-sheer, also for things like water or glass. What I often see is people being very over-aggressive right at the very start of the key and then ending up with quite a patchy looking mat. Now, one of the secrets for not having to be over-aggressive with the key is also good use of garbage mats, which is what we did in exercise three. We also looked at how we could hold things in like the reflections or where we had the shield where the color was being picked up by the key as well. And something else to always be aware of is how we tie the two different elements together. And we've done that in a number of different ways. We added and keyframed in variable lens blur into the background. We added in different elements like lens flare and particles to try and tie those two elements together. And we also put in a common color grade over the top, all of the time while paying particular attention to edge details. Now, obviously, there are a few things that we haven't been able to go through in such a short amount of time, but this is my general way of approaching a green screen shot. And with such a powerful key like Primat Studio, this usually gets me exactly where I need to be. Thanks very much for joining me throughout this series. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the like button. And if you have any questions, then hit me up in the comments below. Also, if you have any war stories about particularly terrible pieces of green screen footage that you were asked to key, then uh, those are always fun to, to listen to as well. My name is Ben Brownlee from Boris Effects, and this has been Pulling the Perfect Key in DaVinci Resolve.